Um, I'm now going to call um, quickly on our last discussant, um, Winston Cole, uh, Senior Financial Management Specialist at the World Bank, um, but also the former Deputy Accountant General of the Ministry of Finance in Sierra Leone, for our final perspective um, on the preconditions for successful PFM reform <coughs> and the country viewpoint. Thank you, Winston. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, Interestingly, most of the issues raised from Afghanistan are very similar to what we went through in, in Sierra Leone, so I will not repeat them, but where it requires to be further emphasized, I, I will do that. From all the speakers so far, it is quite clear that context and culture actually matters. There is no one best way, but like Paul said, at least we need some suggestions around good ways of doing things. Um, I'm now in, in the World Bank, but maybe I should declare that I was with the government of Sierra Leone in the Ministry of Finance in 1998, <laughs> just after the war was tentatively declared over, although it was officially announced in 2001. So when I speak, I try to bring the perspectives of being a PFM practitioner on that side. Since my colleague, colleagues from the bank are here, I will also try to wear the World Bank cap. <laughs> Uh, on the drivers for reforms, in the case of Sierra Leone, having come from more than a decade-old decade civil war, in which the causes were largely said to be that around nepotism and corruption, one would think that if you are putting a PFM system, you will start from the anti-corruption perspective. But then what do you base your anti-corruption measures on? Audit reports are years out of date. Even if they are there, the only thing the Auditor General will talk about is payment voucher not, atti not, not attached or not authorized. So there's not much accountability there other than compliance issues. So the main, driver, the main drivers for the reform were, ba were basically political to for the gov new government to gain political leg legitimacy, an open space to see whether it can start tackling corruption from the front end so that um, when space the space is open up for democratic governance, they find a better chance of winning more, more elections. The priorities, again, we did not start from the budget preparation area, mindful that lack of payment of teachers' salary was an issue that was being used to bring the, the rebel war right into the capital. So you have situations wherein teachers will say they are going on strike, and there are no vouchers to pay. And you come to the treasury, you expect, the, the political class expects money to be made available, otherwise the rebels will hit free town. So the controls were more on what can we do to ensure that there are payment controls in place, rather than the ideal of we need to do a head count, we need to do biometrics. Sorry, half of the, the, the country is not accessible. So you just have to put controls at the center even pay salaries without voucher and see how you try to recover later. Those are the practical issues which can happen in a post-conflict conflict sit situation. On the supplier side, again, coming from a seemingly co corrupt, corrupt environment, mm -hmm. you, would, you would imagine that most suppliers have political connection. So if you have technical assistance, for which most of us, we are locals, um, local technical assistance, almost all of us we are from the UK having finished our ACCA, you have a payment voucher to pay and you have issues with it. If you question it, that guy definitely is highly political. And the next thing is, do you know what this payment is about? If you don't pay it, then the rebels will come to Freetown. So you have all these threats, threats in threats. How do you balance ensuring that you don't pay a fictitious voucher at the same time not being the one to <laughs> cause the rebels to come into town. So a lot of um, soft people's t skills come into these situations rather than just being, there's no payment voucher, I will not pay. Trying to ad ex explain to, to people why things should be done the right way, we were able to see how over time things started changing gradually. On the critical success factors, I think in, without having a budget support in place, and that being used as a leverage, most of the reforms would not have happened. That was a key success factor in, 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 in the reforms. 
at the political level, there was a development assistance coordinating office chaired by the vice president himself. And whatever was agreed at that meeting with the donors found its way into the PFM reform action plan and eventually we are the triggers for budget support. So you can see from the high level dialogue, those issues, if they don't happen, then there is no money flowing into the country without any internally generated revenue. There was over reliance on budget support. In terms of the accounting system, even an accountant general was a foreigner, an Irishman, and with a bunch of local, local, local technical assistance because most of the money was coming from the EU and the only way to trust that those monies will be used, as it was explained then, was to make sure that their man is in their sign having the last say on the check. So what could <coughs> we do? We had to see how we could balance things. The system that was put in place was only known by that one individual because even us, the technical assistants, we are not fully trusted to have access to the system. So all we could do is highly qualified chartered accountants be, be becoming input clerks. We are trusted enough to input the request and only one guy can pay out of the system. But over time, as trust was built, we started having more, more access to the system and providing suggestions from it being just a recording system and turning, turning it into a double entry system and having trial balance for us to start preparing financial statements. So even if you wanted to do audit reforms, there are no financial statements in place. There is no accounting system because it's just single entry. So it takes time for you to know what you need to do first before you move on to the uh, So yes, we started, we, we, were, we were content with the recording system so that payments were made. Over time, it became a double entry system. Then we had what we called an FMAS, not an IFMIS, a financial management accounting system. As things developed, we then moved to a financial management information system and deliberately, uh, I did not use the word I. I was the head of the PFM reform unit in charge of implementing the IFMIS. So <laughs> when I say it, there was no I, even though a project document, a bank project document was to implement an IFMIS, the reality was that it was not as integrated as we hear most IFMISs should be. So we were content we had a very low cost, robust financial management information system managed from the center, as was said, in, in Afghanistan. And it is only recently that we gradually started rolling out to the, to the ministries, departments, and agencies in Freetown. Even though within the project that implemented the IFMIS, there was an intention to roll it out to the 19 local councils, those 19 local councils did not even have power supply to put the system on. And this system relied on 100% uptime. So decision was, this is where flexibility is required. The decision was made midstream to put in place another small accounting system, <coughs> but with the critical issue of it being run on the same standard chart of account. So if it's on the same chart of account, data can be extracted from the 19 councils and be able to consolidate with central government and prepare a general set of financial statements. The challenges that we had were that even when we improved the area of accounting, accountability actually did not happen until recently when the, the audit service is undergoing serious reforms with support from Intosai and other, and other parties. So the Government Budgeting Ac and Accountability Act was upgraded. The Audit Service Act was also upgraded, giving them more independence, and now they are able to do value for money audits. The new laws also now allow them to be able to make their reports public as soon as it is laid in Parliament, which was not the case before. So we had a situation, you improve the accounting, you improve the reporting, the Auditor General does his work, but the public is no wiser what has happened because the law then did not allow the audit report to be made for <coughs> It goes to Parliament at the pleasure of the PAC, that is when it becomes public, but that is changing gradually now. And the area, I think the, the remaining challenge is that around the exit strategy for the capacity substitution. It's been dealt with gradually. Most of the my colleagues who are still there and now have now been recruited into mainstream civil service, but at a different salary scale. So if the internally generated revenue doesn't increase, then it causes some friction within the department itself. You've been paid 
15 times more than the guy next to you. There are issues there. But there is a new ongoing project about public service improvement in which they are trying to rational the salaries and ensure that at least there is equity. To finish, I think there is a lot of recommendations around best practices, but what we need under such circumstances are best fit within good practices with due regard to the administrative structures and the, the political space that we may have to make these reforms happen. Let me stop there for now.